Hello and welcome to the first presentation in Cam Instructor's Big Events. I am Mike Warren and I am with Cam Instructor. Uh, so with that, I have the, the privilege of getting to choose when my presentation would happen. So obviously, I've chosen to go first. Uh, there's a lot of experts that are going to be talking about MasterCam today. And I decided that it would be better for me to try and not to follow one of those presentations up. So here we are with me going first. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm talking about mastering the basics of MasterCam Mill 2D. So mastering and basics uh, kind of don't really go together. It's not a beginner course. This is not an, an advanced topic. Uh, we're kind of somewhere in between, more so on the beginner end. Uh, we've got some presentations later on today that are uh, much more advanced than this one, but this one is still going to be useful. I'm going to be talking about some of the things that can be confusing when you're first getting going with MasterCam. Uh, so I'm not going to be talking about how to draw a line or you know how to change the color of, of things, but more of the concepts of things I find students have troubles uh, adapting to and, and understanding and some of those key components that will make tool pathing later on in your MasterCam career that much easier. So we're going to be looking at things like how do we drive tool paths, a, a piece of wireframe versus a, a solid model, talk about the basics of planes, how planes work, why you would put a plane in one position versus another, and also a brief discussion on fixtures. So a lot of the times I hear students asking about fixtures and bringing them in and how we can use fixtures inside of MasterCam. So with that, you may notice up on screen, I do have MasterCam already opened up. This is MasterCam 2022. I'm not going to be going into a lot of the, the what's new and, and great in MasterCam 2022, but I'm going to touch on a few things as I'm going through, just some of the obvious things. But some of the not so obvious stuff, uh, so again, this is a, is a MasterCam basics course, and if you are using the basics of MasterCam, you're probably using MasterCam HLE. Now, I do want to touch on a few things here, you know, even though this is unofficial at this point since it has not been released, but new features for MasterCam 2022 HLE. We're looking for some new toolpath abilities. So we did not have the ability to run the Milturn environment. We did not have the ability to use port or blade expert. And right now that looks to be enabled in 2022 HLE. So blade expert is a, is a toolpath, a multi-axis toolpath, as is port expert. Uh, but we actually have a lesson in our five axis course that uses blade expert. And unfortunately, our HLE users have not been able to use this, this lesson yet, or at least not been able to follow along in the software themselves. So hopefully in 2022, this is going to be uh, added and uh, you'll be able to use that toolpath uh, throughout HLE. Another one that's going to be added is Productivity Plus. This is the probing add-in from Renishaw. Again, you can't post G-code from HLE, so you're not going to be able to see those macros being output. But at the very least, you can use the interface and use the probe to... Uh, at least pick up your workpiece and go through workpiece measurement, which is becoming more and more popular these days on machines. And these next few ones, I think, are the best updates added yet. Check for updates, autosave, self-explanatory, and export to STL slash 3MF. So check for updates is, is a big one. When HLE was released in the past, basically it got put out, I believe it was July, um, about July, the, the release comes out for HLE. And it kind of, that's the way it was throughout the, the until the next version of uh, HLE was released. So it would not get updates. And as we know, any software that gets made, there's, you know, little bugs, uh, problems that can come up. So anything that was built in that version of HLE that was a small bug, it won't get fixed. Uh, so with these updates, if there is something that doesn't work right, you know, with updates that get pushed out, uh, those will get fixed in HLE now going forward. The autosave is pretty self-explanatory. If you don't use autosave, it's not a bad idea. It's just a way for MasterCam to automatically save your file, and you can even append names to it so you can have different versions. Now, this was not enabled in HLE prior, uh, but now you can use it, and I think it's a great functionality for students, especially when they get down a path and they get into a problem and they're not sure how they got to that problem or how to fix it. You can just jump back, you know, five, six, seven, eight files and kind of run through it again. Uh, the last one here, export to STL and 3MF. This is for the, the 3D printing market, I'm going to assume. I did put a video out a little while back saying that there is ways in HLE to skirt the inability to export file types. 
uh, so that you can export STLs and actually 3D print them. But it looks like now Mastercam has flicked a switch and allowed us to export as STL and 3MF. So those that don't know what 3MF is, it's basically an STL on steroids. It's meant for 3D printing. It's got some extra uh, information in there about your 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 3D print that might might contain as far as slicing layers, uh, bridges, colors, all that uh, that kind of stuff. So it's still typically a 3D modeling file, 3MF. I guess that's what it stands for. Uh, but yeah, some awesome new functionality coming for HLE in 2022, and we're definitely looking forward to it. This list is is small. There's more to it. I just picked out the high points. Okay, so let's hop into a Mastercan demo. First thing I'm doing is grabbing the default mill. And right away, you're going to notice these icons over here are different. So as I said, when we're going through this Mastercam 2022, I'm only going to point out the obvious changes that you're going to see on screen here. And this is probably the most obvious change you're going to see in 2022 is a new set of icons over in the Toolpath Manager. So I'm not going to focus much on that. Let's just carry on. But you're going to see some things that look a little bit different there as far as icons go. So at the pure basics of Mastercam and toolpathing, the simplest way to make a toolpath do what you want to do is to simply take a piece of wireframe, draw a line, and then put a basic toolpath like a contour onto that line. Now once that's done, you have a toolpath that does in fact follow the line that you've drawn in Mastercam. Now why would you want to do this? A lot of courses, even ours, we start with basic wireframe geometry and then toolpathing that wireframe geometry. A lot of people want to jump right in, hop into a solid model, and then get into toolpathing these, these solid models. So the thing, the benefit of this wireframe geometry creation and using it to drive your toolpaths is when you can draw a path, you now have the ability to make that toolpath do whatever it is you can draw. So you're not limited to what the solid model's shape is anymore. You're only limited to basically all of these buttons you see here on the wireframe tab. So if you want a toolpath to in fact cut on a line like this, you draw that line, you put a toolpath on it, that's the G-code you're gonna get. On the flip side, let's have a look at a solid model. So here I've got a solid part up on screen. And again, I can do the exact same thing I did before. Go and grab a basic contour toolpath. And I need to switch my chaining mode. So we're in wireframe. So when you're in wireframe chaining, you can only select wireframe. When you're in solid, you can only select solid. So when I'm in solid here, I don't have any wireframe geometry on this. I can simply come in, grab an edge, and I can use that to now drive my toolpath. Uh, I grabbed that one the wrong way. So I'm going to have to actually switch my compensation here to cut this correctly. And there you can see the toolpath on the solid that's driven by the model itself. Now, as mentioned, we're limited to the shape of the solid here as far as what we can make that toolpath do. Yes, we have options. We can come in and adjust our lead in and lead outs. We can add arcs, remove arcs, make perpendicular, uh, extend contours and all that sort of thing. But we don't have 100% control over that toolpath when we are using the solid model to drive it. So when you get into the more advanced stuff, you know, multi-axis, even some of the 3D stuff, there are times when the model you're given is not making the toolpath do what you want it to do. And you're going to need to have these very basic wireframe drawing skills in your repertoire to be able to do the most complex multi-axis toolpaths. So as crazy as it sounds, uh, wireframe geometry even though it's step one in your Mastercam learning, it's going to be step 501 as well when you're into the multi-axis toolpaths and wanting to do something specific to a toolpath that it just won't work being driven by a solid or a surface. So let's hop into an example of using this customized toolpathing ability in a basic part. So I'm going to do a little pocketing operation here on this part. I've got over on level number three and we'll turn off these other guys. And basically it's a, a solid block with two bosses on it. So I'm going to use the solid model to toolpath this guy. Uh, let's hop into a pocketing operation, switch into solid selection mode here. And I'm going to grab the outer loop. And I picked the wrong one, so let's just clear that. So let's try that again. I want this loop. And I'm going to grab the two loops of these bosses. Okay, so I use the solid model there to do the geometry selection. And I'll go ahead and create this toolpath. 
So there's my toolpath. Uh, it looks pretty straightforward, the same as you would expect in any toolpath. It doesn't matter if we picked solid geometry or wireframe geometry. In this instance, the toolpath would be exactly the same. Now here's what I'm going to show you learning this wireframe creation is we can come in and manipulate this toolpath to do maybe something different than what it's actually doing right now. So if I go ahead and backplot this toolpath, let's play through it all just so you can see it. There it is, the tool's zigzagging back and forth and avoiding those bosses. Let's just speed up now since we've got the, the concept down. And once this has finished up, what I can do is I can save out this wireframe toolpath. I'm going to save out this toolpath as wireframe geometry. I'm going to click this button over here now, save toolpath geometry. And it's asked you for a level 255 is fine for this example. I don't have much in this file, so it's not really a big deal what level I pick. And green check out of this. I'm going to turn this toolpath off before I go and look at this. This is important because it can be confusing when you see your toolpath overlaid on top of geometry. That's exactly the same color as your toolpath. And then figuring out what's what. So just when you're doing this, make sure you turn your toolpath off. Now over on level 255, there it is. I can turn that on and notice it looks like I turned my toolpath back on. But in fact, what I did was I turned on the wireframe geometry that's been created out of the back plot. So now here's where you have the ability to go in and change this toolpath to what it is you want to do. So this isn't a direct relation though, so don't get me wrong. You can't come in here and make a change to the wireframe and this toolpath updates. That's not what's, what's going to happen here. Uh, this toolpath is just serving as a, a source or a donor, I guess, a donor operation for some wireframe geometry for the motion you actually want. So I don't want to get too, too involved with this, but let's say, for example, you don't want arcs in your G-code. So you, you want this gone. So, okay, let's go ahead and, uh, and fix that up here. We'll do a trim two, and we'll trim this to this and delete this rad in there. And now when we rechain this, it will chain a sharp corner here instead of the rad. Um, you know, is this applicable? I don't know. I'm just giving an example of what we can do. Um, I'm also going to end this toolpath right here. I'm just going to do a quick little swipe down and swipe back uh, just to not be here for an hour editing this toolpath. Another thing, unless you want a 3D contour, we need to get rid of this vertical stuff in here. And now we could go ahead and let's pretend we edited this whole path and now we're, we're ready to rechain it. What we, you would do this time is you would just do a straight up contour toolpath, select that wireframe geometry, hit OK, making sure you pick the same tool that your source or donor operation uh, that you created. And the difference here is you're going to turn compensation now off. So that wireframe toolpath that was backplotted and turned into geometry, that was a toolpath motion relative to the center of the cutter. So we can't have a toolpath from the center of the cutter and then offset it again afterwards, we'll get bad motion. So that's why we're turning it off here. So let's go ahead and green check. So there's my toolpath. Let's go ahead and, and backplot this. And you can see as I play through, tool comes down, does the little swoop in as a lead-in motion, and it follows that geometry that I did before. Notice the rad is now gone. So again, if we chained more geometry, we could follow through this whole toolpath. Uh, one thing that's kind of obvious here is these, these lead-in and lead-outs don't need to be there. Let's go ahead and get rid of those. Let me just hop over here, and let's just uh, turn those off, and I'll do... Uh, well, let's leave them on, but let's turn this and this off and maybe just do an extension on the exit of, say, 75%. So here's something new for 2022. Again, I didn't say I would point it out unless it's obvious. And this one should be obvious. I'm editing the parameters of a toolpath. I click OK. Notice my operation is not dirty right now. It's rebuilt. It's not like it hasn't rebuilt, but notice it's not dirty. So new in 2022. Down at the bottom is this little guy right here, this little checkbox, Generate Toolpath. So basically what this means, when you check this, if you make some edits in your toolpath, when you green check, if this, if this is checked here, it will automatically regenerate itself once you're done. If I uncheck this and make a change, let's go back to say 80%, there's the old Mastercam behavior you're used to. Toolpath goes dirty, you come back, you regen, now your toolpath's good. So depending on the behavior you want, you're going to either want to checkbox this or uncheck it. Cool new feature. I think it's great to leave it checked. That's my personal preference anyways. So there's an example as to the power you can have over a toolpath if you understand how to create wireframe geometry. You're not at the mercy of 
a solid model, and you're not at the mercy of a toolpath either. You've got complete flexibility to manipulate the toolpath to do what it is you want it to do. So next up, I said we were going to talk about planes. Let's go ahead and look at planes now. I'm going to switch back over to this small part. Let's turn off that wireframe geometry there. And let's turn off these previous toolpaths as well so they're not in the way. Okay, so here's the, here's this part. It's floating in space right now. I don't really know where it is, but we can still start toolpathing this part and program the entire thing just with it where it is right now. So this is a, a common problem with parts that you get from engineering. If you're so lucky to get these solid models from engineering departments somewhere, whether in your company or someone else's, uh, these solid models will come into Mashcam and they are not always in position as to where you would have it on your machine. So when you draw a part like this, it doesn't matter if it's on origin, what we refer to in the machining world as, as origin, or if it's out in the middle of nowhere in 3D space. Sometimes it has to be out in the middle of nowhere in 3D space for it to fit into this assembly. Um, and then they export it from the assembly, you know, but us in the machining world, we like things to be right in the middle where it's supposed to be. So this is where we get into talking about planes and plane creation. So this part here, uh, there, there would be a couple setups to make this part. We've got holes going in through the side, holes going through in the, through the top. Uh, again, we're talking mill 2D, so we're not talking a multi-axis setup here, but at the very least, we've got one setup here, one setup here, and we would need at least one more to do the bottom, unless we got really, really fancy. So we're looking at at least three setups on this part, maybe four, depending on how you want to handle this slot in here. Now, this is where you can get into debates on what's the right way, what's the best way uh, to do a part like this and how to set it up. Now, it does kind of depend. This is going to lead into our fixture discussion in a minute, um, but we'll come back to that. But basically, you can take this part as is when it's laying here in Mashcam in 3D space, even though it's not on origin, and we can create planes and place those planes on this part and start programming it. So let's start at step number one, and let's find out where origin is in our file. So right now, I don't know where x0, y0 is. So we need a way to be able to see where origin is in order to orient our part to it. There's a bunch of different ways on the view tab. We can do this show axes. This is not my favorite way to, to do it. Some guys prefer this this orientation here, this this view. The, the gripe I have with it, um, well, I guess it doesn't matter if you're not really concerned about polarity and di direction and, and axes, but when you spin this thing around, you don't know which one is X, which one is Y, and which one is Z, unless you start looking at your nomens over here. So I typically don't use the show axes too much. There's also this guy over here, show grid. And let me just get this baby down to a more manageable size, like uh, one inch. And this just shows you, it does show you where origin is. Origin is the middle of this grid. Uh, but again, it has the downfall is you don't know which way is up. Is up going this way or is up that way? So you don't know which way Z positive is, I guess, is the way to tell. You know which the plane for X and Y is, but which way is up. Uh, so I typically don't like this one a lot, but my favorite one to use is the show nomen button. So you turn this guy on and you get your little nomen or triad or whatever you want to call it uh, displayed. You've got Z, X, and Y, and they're all pointing in the positive direction. So this is relative to the currently selected plane, which is top. Okay, uh, so whether or not we move our part to our world or our master cam origin, or if we make a new plane here, is it up to the user. It's up to you and what you think is the best way to do it. Um, I will say this about moving this part to the origin. So let's say we take this and we move this. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's do a, a dynamic. And we're going to move this part, and let me just, uh, I said let's do a dynamic, not a trans. So let's do a dynamic, grab the part, and I want to place the gnomon right at the intersection here. Okay, and now I'll switch back over here, and I'll use the ball here and pull it over to our datum. Okay, so typically when you get into a part like this, what's going to happen is you're going to want to do what we refer to as file management, uh, file organization, keeping things neat and tidy, relatable, so that if you program this part today, 
in two months from now, you can open it back up and know what you were doing. Or the guy beside you opens it next week and he can tell what you were doing from the get-go. So typically, you know, a common practice might be to make a new toolpath group here. So let's go a new group, new toolpath group, and maybe we have uh, what we'll call setup one. Setup one from the top. Okay, so all of our toolpaths that we're attacking the part from, from this side, so looking down at it, you know, machining this face, this step, these two chamfers, and these two holes, will be inside of setup one. And another common thing to do is to take the plane that's associated with that setup and name it the same thing. So I would call this one setup one top. Now the problem with Mastercam is we can't edit, rename, move, whatever, any of these system default planes. So I can't take this top plane and rename it setup one top plane. I can't do that. Um, so I have to make a new plane anyways. Either I duplicate this top plane and then edit that result, or I create a brand new one, whichever way you want to go about this. So let's go ahead and uh, I'll duplicate this guy. Duplicate. And now I can rename this one, you know, setup one. Okay, so now we've got that plane. I need to now make that my WCS, my construction plane, and my tool plane. And now I'm ready to go ahead and start tool pathing, or am I? So next thing you need to be concerned about with your planes, especially when we're doing multiple planes, now it depends on you, we want to handle this. Again, there's more than one way to go about programming a part. There's more than one way to process it on the machine. And these are things you need to think about uh, as you're programming the parts, you need to think ahead of as to how many parts you're making. Number one, that's a, that's a big one, but how is this going to be set up on the machine? Are you taking one component and making one part? So basically you're going to load this one part into your vice, machine it, and you're going to flip it over, machine the next one, flip it over, and machine the next side. Or are you having side one in one vice, side two in another vice, and side three in yet another vice? So three sides running at once, or maybe you're doing still three setups, but three of the same operation at once, these are things you need to take into consideration because if we're in the machine and we're running three different sides of the part, we're probably running three different work offsets. Okay, so with our planes comes work offsets. So this side of the part we want maybe as our G54. When we do this side over here, maybe this is setup number, let's go with setup number three. I'm going to say the setup number two is going to be this side. So number two will be G55. This guy over here will be G56. And if we were doing another slot over here, that would be G57. So as we're making our planes, it would be nice if our planes were relative to a work offset. So that, again, is something you need to watch for. And it is set in your plane. So setup number one is going to come down here. And I'm going to go manual. And I'm going with zero. I would not trust the automatic to create the correct planes for you. I like to come in here and force my work offset to what I want it to be. So setup number one, a zero. Now you see the zero in the offset field. Zero is G54. And let's say we were going to then program this side. Let's make a plane over here real quick. Let's just uh, come up here. It's not snapping to my face. Okay, we need to... Uh, so our X is pointing that way. Let's get this locked in in line again. And we need to flip around 180. Okay, so this would be, let's go set up. This is going to be the bottom of our part. Okay, so green check. So set up one, this side. Set up two is this guy over here. And as mentioned, we need to set our offset manual number one. And this is going to ensure we get uh, anything with this plane posted will be output as G55. So again, we would do the same thing with this plane over here, setting it to number two. So we get G56. So now we get into the variation and the discussion. Do we have to do it that way? Well, obviously, no, you know, you don't have to. So you don't have to program this one part in this one orientation using those three, two, four, whatever it is, planes, like I just mentioned. There's other ways to go about it, and there's other ways 
or the other reasons why you might want to go about this a little bit differently. So let me just go into another setup here and I'll go through those reasons. All right, so let's throw a tool path onto this part. Now I'm not gonna go through the drilling and the chamfering and all that stuff. Let's just go through with probably the more obscure tool path and that's gonna be the slitting slot cutting through these grooves in here. So let's just grab this piece of geometry here. Uh, I've got a holder made up already, this two inch slitting saw. And I think everything else here is good. Leading lead outs, I've just got extensions. Let's just do an extension on both here. And let's just double check to make sure I got this turned on the computer on the left hand side. And then we should be good with our slitting saw going through and cutting that groove. Okay, so as is right now, this looks like it should be fine. Again, this is a multi setup part. We've got at least three setups. Um, we would have a fourth if we didn't use this slitting saw. So that's why we've gone ahead and chosen to use this type of operation, this type of tool to save ourselves a setup. Uh, so at first glance, if we were to simulate this whole part, this would simulate collision free, everything's great. Send it to the machine, push go, and let's start making some parts. Okay, the problem is going to come up when you realize that what you have out on your machine looks more like this. So you've got a three part setup, you've got a dual station vise, and you've got your three parts in there, all oriented correctly for the op that's going to happen. So as you can imagine, if we are to take this slitting saw operation and run it through this part right here, this extension is obviously going to cut into our other part. That's gonna be a problem. You're not gonna see that come up in a part orientation like this. So again, do you have to use fixtures when you're talking basic mill 2D stuff? You don't have to, but fixtures, when you get into the more you know complex setup in mill 2D, uh, mimicking the setup on your machine is definitely gonna pay dividends to pick up on problems like this. So when you do as well, when you get into a setup like this, you've now got to make the decision on your plane usage. Do you want individual planes for each part? So they're all going to be oriented the same. They're all going to have Z in the same direction because we've got three individual parts. We don't have to reorient the plane to a new side. We've reoriented the part. We're just now moving our planes. So if you wanted uh, this guy over here to be G54, we would need to make that plane over here. Again, lined up depending on where it is we want our origin to be. Let's make sure I get that point there. Okay. And we could just call this uh, multi op one. And you just make up a new toolpath group as well. New toolpath group. Let's go multi. And I'm not going to make op specific ones, so let me just copy this toolpath. Copy paste it over into there. Let's grab some new geometry, rechain all. Let's grab this edge of this part. Okay, we need to edit our parameters in here and change the planes. And here we can also make our work offset change inside of the operation. So I went ahead and made a plane, but I didn't update that offset information about it. I can change it in here as well. So here we'll go manual. And in this instance, so this is gonna be separate from this example up here. So I'm again gonna be using G54 for op number one. So let's go ahead and call that zero. So since I've made this work offset change inside of the operation, Mashcam is gonna prompt me here to make sure I'm, I'm doing what I intend to and give me alternative options in case this is not what I intend to do. So basically, since I've changed the work offset of this plane, Mashcam is asking, number one, do you want to update the plane and all the operations that use this plane? So if other operations had been created previously that were, say, G55, and I'm now switching an operation using that same plane that's using G54, do I want to change all those previous operations? Um, if so, I checkbox this first one. Second option is Mashcam will duplicate the plane I've selected, give it this new offset, leaving everything that's been done before as is. So I'm not breaking anything previous. 
So if you had some operations in there that were currently G55 and you don't want to change them, this is the one that you would pick. And the last option here is only apply this changed offset to this toolpath. Again, if that's what the behavior you want, that's what you would select. Typically, you know, safest way I would suggest is a plane is a work offset. If you want a different work offset for a plane, I would make a new plane and give that a new work offset. Okay, so our toolpath has auto rebuilt since to our thanks to our our lovely new feature called generate toolpath. That's uh, fantastic. And now we could actually backplot this. Let me turn off our part that's floating in thin air. And now we can really see the issue in our multi-part setup that we're going to have with this lead out. Okay, so just, uh, I, we knew this was going to be a problem, just a visual confirmation um, and why you would want to do this. Now let's get into to, to plane selection here. Other options other than creating a plane for each part. So this vice could be considered uh, a dedicated fixture at this point. And what you can do with that is on this fixed jaw, you can bore a datum into it. So we could bore a hole right here. Um, obviously not into these red caps. That's where there's a bolt underneath. But you could bore a hole in here just deep enough that you could, your probe can fit in and pick it up. And that can give you a reference location. And that could be your G54 X0 Y0. Uh, now Z0, that could come from anywhere else. It could come from the top of the vise. It could come from the top of a part. That's another discussion for another time. But basically, if you picked up this hole in the middle of the vise and machined your soft jaws relative to those holes, you can now machine all these parts relative to this G54 work offset. And you don't need individual offsets for each individual component. You need just one work offset the downfall being that the G code that gets output is not going to be relative to the part. So say if you're trying to drill a hole, if this is over, uh, say, half of an inch from this edge, the G code relative to this hole over here or this datum over here, you're not going to see that nominal dimension from your print. So that can be a, a bit of a downfall, especially if guys are reading prints looking for a movement of half of an inch and the drill's moving 842 thou. Um, they're not going to be able to connect the dots between what should be happening and what is actually happening in the program. So that's a downfall into using one dedicated work offset for multiple pieces on a, on a pallet or a, a vice setup like this. Let's look at another benefit. So we've got the collision avoids benefits. One single datum is a benefit. Another benefit, so let's say we're taking an end mill we're cutting across this face. We're going to be using that same end mill to cut across this face over here. If we're using multiple planes, then that means we're, we're basically looking at multiple tool paths. We can't uh, have one tool path that uses two different planes. So we can't contour both of these edges inside of one tool path. We'll have contour one using G54 plane, uh, contour two using G55. Um, so we're going to have retracts. The base of the point is there. We're going to have a contour cut, retract, reposition, uh, plunge, and cut again. If we're using one offset, so one central offset, we can now go back to that skill we talked about, which is our wireframe creation, our wireframe driving our tool paths. And what I can do here, let me just go over to this level over here, and let's, let's pick a color that's going to show up. Uh, purple will probably show up pretty good. And I can create the path that I want this piece of wireframe, if I can draw it, to follow. So let's go from here to here. And we'll have one from there to there. And when I'm cutting this contour, I want to cut across this part. And instead of retracting, I want it to ramp down and then cut across the next part. So I'm just going to extend this one by 300 thou, extend this one by 300 thou. Connect those lines. And now in a tool path over here, I can do a contour. Instead of grabbing a solid edge, I'm now grabbing that created wireframe. And this will drive my half inch tool across both parts. So looking parameters, incremental zero. I'm on a 3D cut. That's all good. Lead in, lead out is still fine. We could reduce that. Double check computer and left. Generate toolpath, let's backplot. 
And the benefit here, as you can see, it cuts across the one part completely, drops down, machines across the second part. So if you are using, like I said, the one central plane tool pass like that with your wireframe creation can save you massive amounts of time. If you're making one component, this is not a setup you're gonna be doing. If you're making hundreds, maybe thousands, well, maybe thousands, you might be getting into a more complex setup than this. Uh, but yeah, 100 pieces, this might be a setup that you do with a dedicated uh, single plane as a reference. Now, there was a few more things I wanted to, to touch on, but it looks like I'm probably about out of time if I want to leave some time for Q&A. I was going to talk about using macro variables to control the heights of these two uh, different steps. And I was also going to talk about a tip about saving your uh, fixtures in an edited mode so that they come in much easier, but those will have to remain for the next big event, I guess. So, so with that, give me about uh, five, 10 seconds here and I'll get things switched over into Q and A mode and we'll start going through some of the questions that you guys have. Okay, uh, so there it was. That was the first presentation for the big event. Uh, and it's now time for the first Q and A of the big event. So just a couple of questions here. I guess uh, I guess not much else has come up. So we'll talk about these two questions over here in the Q and A. Uh, if anything else pops up, we'll go through that as well. Uh, so first one here, Wayne has a question about these new features I talked about in 2022 HLE. If they will be added to the educational version of MasterCam. Um, I can't comment directly on that. I guess I could comment, but my comment will just be a random guess, so probably not a great answer. However, uh, Clint is doing a presentation today. He would be the best guy to ask about that, um, and he would be able to give you the exact right answer. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say that it's, it's probably, um, because of the educational version of MasterCam, you can create G-code. Uh, I'm going to assume that it, these new features would be a paid uh, option in the educational version. But again, I'm only guessing, and Clint would be the best guy to ask about that. Um, Jim's got a question here about mouse usage. So, yeah, I, I use a 3D mouse. It's a 3D connection mouse, a space mouse. Um, if you do a lot of CAD CAM, I would highly recommend getting one. There's different versions. There's like the mothership that's this huge thing. You could, it's got a wrist rest on it and everything. And it's got an LCD screen for some reason. I don't know why it's got one, but it's got one. Um, <laughs> and it's got, there's little small ones as well. A little more portable, a little more affordable, uh, work exactly the same. Uh, but I would definitely recommend getting one. They're super useful. And once you use one for a, about a month or so, you won't be able to work in CAD CAM without one. So uh, 3D connection, Space Mouse is what it is. Um, Elder's got a question here. How do we add a fixture like a vice? So I think we're talking about just in general bringing a fixture in. Uh, let me go ahead and hop into a screen share here and maybe we can go through that kind of quick. Just give me a second here to launch into a screen share of MasterCam. Excuse me. Okay, so here we got MasterCam. Uh, my part's already in here, so maybe let's... Uh, I think the best way for me to do this would be to, okay, just turn everything off. Maybe just leave this guy on over here. Okay, so bringing in parts. Uh, I have to get that to find my part here. Okay, so there's a couple different ways we can go about this. Uh, you can use the file merge button over here in the Explorer. Uh, the way I typically like to do it, though, is I like to use my Windows uh, File Explorer, and I'll drag and drop from it. Uh, so basically, this is my vice here, the Chick 1540. Uh, this is the edited version I kind of mentioned in uh, in the presentation there. There's two different versions here, and maybe I should go through those as well. But basically, all you need to do from your File Explorer, uh, left-click and hold, drag it to the graphics area, hold down Control, and when you let go of your left mouse button, you are brought into the merge option. So dragging and dropping without control is a file open. Uh, dragging and dropping while holding control is a file merge. And I'll just bring this into the active level. 
And there's the vice. A um, couple things on the vice. Maybe let's just do this so I can show the comparison here. I'll turn that vice off. Okay. Why can't I turn that off? It seems to be living on multiple levels here. <laughs> uh, very interesting. I'm just going into a new file then. All right. So as mentioned, uh, this is the direct download from the Chick website. This is what the vice looks like. Um, do colors matter in MashCam? No, the colors don't matter. It just makes a better visual if you take the time to edit your vice and add some colors to it. Uh, but also notice in my top view, the vice has come in. I'm looking at the back of it. On the flip side, if I open this guy up, this is my edited version of that vice. Notice it's got all the colors in it. And notice in my plain top view, I'm looking down at the top of the vice. So that when you edit your, your vices or your fixtures to save them like this, when you do that file merge, so if I'm starting out with, with this part here, and let's say I was in a plane relative to that face, let's just make this active. Okay, so when you bring in, when you go again back to merge, and I'll bring in my edit advice. Set this to the C plane and the, the vice will come in oriented the way you saved it, aligned to the active plane. So notice my top of my vice is coming into my top of my active WCS. So saving your vices out with that uh, extra bit of information, extra bit of work can save you a lot of time when you go to bring them into your individual files. Okay, so let me just hop out of the screen share here. Okay, I'm gonna try and get my chat panel back up here to see where we're at. Whoa, okay, so lots, lots more in the, the Q&A here. And we got for time, we got a bit of time here. Okay, so how do you orient a solid face to a specific axis in model prep? Uh, I'm a bit confused by that one. Sorry, Bruce, I'm not really catching. If you're gonna expand on that, Bruce, maybe I can uh, give an answer for that. Elder, how can you easily move selected geometry to another plane? Uh, the best way for that, so in, in MasterCam, uh, I guess it, it, it's going to come down to what's better. Do you want to make a new plane on that geometry or do you want to flip that part to another plane? Uh, let me hop back into a screen share here again. Uh, on the transform, uh, there's a button over here called transform to plane. Uh, that's, again, this is different for 2022. In 2021, this is underneath translate. In 2021, there's a, a, a button you have to click to get to translate the plane. Yeah, basically select your, your, your part, your geometry, whatever it is. And basically select the plane that you're starting from and then where you want to end up and it will move. And let me just hop back out of here again. Uh, maybe we can stay in the screen share here. Stop me from fumbling back and forth, and I'll try and. Uh... Uh, how would you handle multiple machines as a back best practice? Separate file for each machine, op or new machine group in a single file, and why one over the other? I personally would suggest multiple machine groups inside of one file, I guess because it keeps everything in one area. Uh, so we could have, uh, yeah, we could have a mill, we could have a lathe op, we could have, you know, whatever else, a wire, wires as well. So all these different machines, different operations we could have within the one file. Uh, the reason why I would say that, I think as far as, especially revision control, uh, it's gonna save you some headaches. Because if you have three separate files and then you get a revised part and you bring in that revised part to the original file, uh, 
you've now got to bring that revised part into each one. Make sure you don't forget one along the way. And another thing, you might make an adjustment to a toolpath you made in a milling operation that affects the stock that's going to be going to the lathe operation. And if everything's within one file, it's going to make that a little easier to see uh, versus trying to remember what you did in the mill versus what you need to now transfer over to the other file uh, that's the lathe. But again, there's, is it the best way is the right way? It's a personal preference. It's what works for you, but that's what I would suggest is keeping it within one file. Uh, we got here 12.45. Okay, we can do a bit more here. How do you copy move geometry to another level? Okay, Elder, okay. Uh, moving stuff from one level to another. There's, again, more than one way to do this in Mastercam. Um, let me just make another level here, level three. So this solid here is obviously on level one. So I can, I can, uh, I can select that. Uh, I can right click and I got a change level button over here. So change level and you get the options for either move, copy. Uh, so let's do a copy over to, uh, I can uncheck this level and, and give it, you know, whatever level you want. Uh, let's go to 15. Okay, so now I've got one over on number 15. Let's turn all this stuff off. Another option. Let me just make a new level here. That's 24 is fine. Um, you can go in here right clicking on the level copy and paste. Uh, but keep in mind that that is going to take everything from a level. So if you've got multiple parts, multiple geometry, uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. Easiest way, select the individual thing you wanna move, right click and use this guy up over here. Um, I think we're gonna have to shut her down. We're about, uh, 1250. Uh, another webinar is starting up soon, and that will be uh, Jesse. Uh, Jesse is the, or not the, but he is a uh, <laughs> applications engineer uh, for CNC software, works directly at Mastercam. Uh, he'll be going through some 3D toolpaths as well as changing those 3D toolpaths into multi-axis toolpaths, talking more about what's happening in 2022. Um, if there's some things I did not answer here, feel free to take them over to that uh, webinar as well. And uh, so just got a question here about uh, work offsets with rotaries. Uh, again, I think the multi-axis questions are gonna be best left for, for Jesse and uh, the, at the end of the day, uh, Ron. Um, tried to keep this this presentation a little more on the, the basic side, but uh, yeah, I think we're gonna wrap it up at this point. And I'm gonna send you all off over to Jesse's presentation. So when I end this webinar, it should take you back to the main, main the main screen there, um, and you should be able to find the next uh, webinar. Click that link, and it should take you to the waiting room. Uh, so with that, yeah, we're about 50 minutes in. Uh, it leaves me about 10 minutes to get over to Jesse and help him out. So again, I thank everybody for uh, showing up today and taking part. Um, good turnout, fantastic turnout, actually. Uh, hopefully you got use of this first webinar, and hopefully the rest of the ones today uh, you'll find useful as well. So again, uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you over in Jesse's presentation in about uh, 11 minutes.